And now it's my great pleasure to introduce a graduate of Gateway High School who uh, <laughs> has come back graciously from Silicon Valley to talk to us. That would be Paul Graham, co-founder of Y Combinator. <laughs> Hmm. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I am here because of Meg Cheever, and specifically because <laughs> Meg Cheever sent me a Jack Lambert shirt. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you want to get someone's attention, get them what they really wanted when they were 12, but they couldn't afford. So. <laughs> I thought the least thing, the least I could do is wear it. Um, so I'm gonna, I notice in this talk, I often use the phrase, the empirical evidence. Um, and I thought I would give you a little example of the empirical approach. Um, you see there's a bite out of this. I brought my seven-year-old with me. Um, and a few days ago, I taught him about how you could actually eat some packing peanuts because they're made out of corn. Um, actually, they're basically Cheetos with no flavoring which really makes you think twice when you're eating Cheetos. So <laughs> I noticed um, he had tried expanding his horizons a little bit and taken a bite out of the bowl. <laughs> the empirical approach doesn't always work. Um, <clears throat> all right. So I'm going to talk about Pittsburgh and startups. I figured that's what you guys would want me to talk about. It's either that or Pittsburgh and Lisp. Um, you probably want to hear about startups, right? So um, I'm going to talk about what it would take to turn Pittsburgh into a startup hub. Um, I'm sort of gonna do office hours with Pittsburgh and talk about Pittsburgh the way I would talk to a startup. I feel like I understand Pittsburgh pretty well since I grew up in Monroeville. Um, and I understand Silicon Valley pretty well because that's where I live now. So what would it take to do the same thing here? Um, when I agreed to speak here, I didn't think I was gonna be able to give a very optimistic talk. I thought I was going to be talking about what Pittsburgh could do to become a startup hub, very much in the subjunctive. But instead, I'm going to talk about what Pittsburgh can do. And what changed my mind was an article I read recently in, of all places, the New York Times food section. <laughs> it was called Pittsburgh's Youth Driven Food Boom. Many people might look at an article like that and think, That's, what's, why is that even interesting? And especially, what does it have to do with startups? But to me, I could not have thought of a more promising title to read. It was electrifying to read that. And I got even more exciting when I read the article. It said, people ages 25 to 29 now make up 7.6% of all residents, up from 7% about a decade ago. Wow, I thought, Pittsburgh could become the next Portland. Pittsburgh could become the place all the rootless 20-somethings want to go live, right? <laughs> well, that's actually a good thing. Um, when I got here a couple days ago, I could feel the difference. I lived here from 1968 to 1984, and I had no idea of it at the time because I didn't have anything to compare it to, but during that entire period, Pittsburgh was in free fall. If you go and look at graphs of the population, like, the, the, the population of Pittsburgh started declining in 1960, and it stopped, like, last week, right? <laughs> um, it, was, it seemed normal to me that there were abandoned houses. That's what places were like, right? Um, uh, you know, on top of the, the, white, the, the sort of flight to the suburbs that happened everywhere, the nuclear industry and the steel industry were both simultaneously dying. Um, but now, things are different. You can feel it. I could feel it as soon as I got here. It's not just that downtown seems a lot more prosperous. There's an energy here that there was not here when I was a kid. When I was a kid, this was a place where people went to work and did their work and ate their lunch and made money and supported their families, and that was it, right? And now there's a sort of buzz in the air, um, which I am very sensitive to. I'm always looking for that. When I was a kid, this was a place um, young people left, and now it seems to be a place that net attracts them, and that is a very big deal. Um, what does that have to do with startups? Startups are made of people. They don't have factories or mines or anything like that. They're made of people, and specifically 25 to 29-year-olds. 
if you look at a typical startup, most of the employees are exactly in the middle of that 25 to 29 year old bracket. Basically, a one year old startup, they're 25, <laughs> and a four year old startup, they're 29. I'm serious, I asked a whole bunch of Y Combinator startups. It was uncanny, the pattern. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of how important those people are. Those people have already shifted the center of gravity of Silicon Valley. About five years ago, I mean, I can remember the exact moment. It was when Pinterest and Stripe both moved to San Francisco because they started down in Palo Alto in the valley proper. Um, five years ago, the center of gravity of Silicon Valley shifted. Google and Facebook are down on the peninsula, but all the big winners since are up in the city. And the reason the center of gravity shifted was those people, the 25 to 29 year olds. The talent war, especially for programmers, because 25 to 29 year olds don't want to live in the boring suburbs. They want to live in the city. So founders knew they had to be in the city whether they liked it or not. I know multiple founders who have moved up to the city of San Francisco from the valley who didn't want to, but they knew they had to because otherwise they would lose the talent war. So if you have those people, the startups follow to some extent. So being a magnet for people in their 20s is a very valuable thing to be. In fact, it's hard to imagine a place becoming a startup hub without also being that. When I read that statistic about the number of 25 to 29, I seem a little obsessed with this. That's because it's one of those leading indicators that's very important. Um, you know, you might think if I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give a little bit of a um, spoiler here. You might think if I'm gonna talk about how to turn this place into a Silicon Valley, a lot of this talk is gonna be about innovation and entrepreneurship. Well, it's not. Um, it's gonna be about things that seem unrelated, but the, the, are the actual things that I saw win in San Francisco. I've seen this happen before. Um, so, even though it'll seem like my suggestions are a little bit out in left field, that's the way these things work. Um, so, where was I? Okay, so, um, when I saw that statistic about the number of 25 to 29 year olds increasing, I had exactly that same feeling of excitement that I get when I see a startup's graph start to inch up off the x-axis, right? It's the beginning of something. So, what do we got? Nationally, I went and did a little research about this. Nationally, the percentage of 25 to 29 year olds is 6.8%. You have 7.6%, 7 that's a 0.8% difference. How many people is that? The population is 306,000, so we're talking about a surplus of about 2,500, 25 to 29 year olds, right? That's a decent sized small town, and that's just the surplus. So you have a toehold, you just have to expand it. Like something is already working, and you just have to keep it working. Um, and though a youth-driven food boom may sound a little frivolous, it's anything but. Restaurants and cafes are a lot of what gives a town its personalities. Imagine, this is a pleasant thought on a snowy day in Pittsburgh, imagine walking th down a street in Paris. What are you walking past? You're walking past little restaurants and cafes. Okay, now something a little less pleasant. Um, imagine driving through some random exurb, right? What are you driving past? Starbucks, McDonald's, Pizza Hut. As Gertrude Stein said, there is no there there. You could be anywhere. So, these little restaurants and cafes are not just feeding people. I'm really glad I got to put this sentence in here. I hope I don't mess this up. They're making there be a there here. <laughs> I did it, I didn't mess it up. But it's true, there's a there here, and that's why people wanna come. Isn't that great you get to say things like that? Um, so here is my first concrete recommendation from Mr. Technology for turning Pittsburgh into a big startup hub. Do everything you can to encourage that youth-driven food boom. Um, what could the city do? Is that guy from the city here? Or did he rush off to run the city? Oh well, well someone tell him. You all know each other, right? Um, here's what you should do. This is what I would tell a startup to do. If those restaurants and cafes are bringing here, treat the people running those restaurants and cafes as your users and go ask them what they want. I could guess one thing they might want, a super fast permit process. And there, San, oh really, all right. San Francisco has left you a space the size of an Airbus 380 to do better in that respect. Um, so take advantage of it, you know, it's what you got. 
Um, that's what I tell startups. These, this big incumbent has left some gap. You just shoot through it um, like a running back, and then I will get you. <laughs> Couldn't help it. Um, anybody understand that reference? You know, yeah. <laughs> I can't talk about Jack Lambert. <laughs> mm. All right, back to my talk. Um, ah. I know restaurants are not the prime mover, mover though. The prime mover is cheap housing, um, just like the article said. But that phrase, cheap housing, is a little misleading, because there are a lot of places cheaper than this. What's special about Pittsburgh is it's a cheap place you'd actually want to live, right? <laughs> um, and part of that is the buildings themselves. I realized a long time ago, back when I was a poor 20-something myself, that the best places to live were places that had once been rich and then got poor, right? Because places that were, had always been rich were nice, but they're too expensive. Places that have always been poor are cheap but grim. But if you find a place that had once been rich and then got poor, you can find palaces for cheap. And that is what is drawing all these hipsters here. Um, a hundred years ago, the people who lived here built these big, solid buildings. Not always in the best taste, but definitely solid. Um, so here's my second concrete recommendation for becoming a startup hub, which also has nothing to do with technology. Don't destroy the buildings that are bringing the young people here. Okay, good. Um, those, uh, when a city is on the way back up, like Pittsburgh is, there are always real estate developers who want to come in and tear down the old buildings and make new ones that will make them more money. But those big new development projects are not what's bringing the 20-somethings here. I mean, they may be good for something or not, but they are definitely not what is bringing, what is making this place the new Portland. Um, so focus on historic preservation. Don't let that happen. These new, like a big development project is the opposite of little restaurants and cafes. They subtract personality from the city, right? Um, the empirical evidence here again suggests you just cannot be too strict about historic preservation. Like it, it seems like the stricter cities are, the better they do. Okay, the appeal of Pittsburgh though is not just the buildings. Pittsburgh, share, Pittsburgh is lucky, like San Francisco and New York, in being a pre-car town. Things are not too spread out because those 25 to 29 year olds do not like driving. When I was a 25 to 29 year old, I didn't own a car and I would not have lived anywhere that required it. They like to walk and bicycle and take public transit. And if you have been to San Francisco recently, you probably noticed the enormous number of bicycles. It's like Beijing is going in one direction and San Francisco is going back towards what Beijing was like. Um, it's not a coincidence. This is not a fad that the 20-somethings have discovered. The beards will go, but not the bikes. They have discovered <laughs> Uh, there's surprisingly few fashionable beards here, actually. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, maybe, maybe. I see some unfashionable beards, but not those <laughs> giant fashionable kind, just old Unix hacker neck beards. Um, cities where you can get around without driving are just better, period. So this is not a temporary trend. You can bet on bikes. Um, so, as w and as with historic preservation, the empirical evidence suggests you can't go too far. So, why not make Pittsburgh the most bicycle and pedestrian friendly city in the country, right? Someone could be number one, why not here? Why not here? Um, I can pretty much guarantee you won't regret it. The city will seem a paradise to the young people you want to attract. If they do leave to take jobs somewhere else, it will be like looking longingly back over their shoulder at the fabulous life they had here. And increasingly, they won't leave. And what's the downside? Can you imagine a headline, city ruined by becoming too bicycle friendly? You know, I mean, I can imagine angry, edit, angry letters to the editor. Yes, headlines, no, it just doesn't happen. So, Suppose old neighborhoods and cool little restaurants make this the next Portland. Is that gonna be enough? 
well, it will put you in a lot better position than Portland itself or any of these other magnets for 20-somethings because you have something Portland lacks, a first-rate research university. So you're not just going to have hipsters sitting in cafes drinking lattes. You're going to have hipsters sitting in cafes drinking lattes and talking about distributed systems. And now you're very close to San Francisco. Right? In fact, better than San Francisco in some ways because CMU is right downtown and Stanford and Berkeley are out in the burbs and with a brutal, a brutal drive to get to them, let me tell you. Um, what can CMU specifically do to help Pittsburgh become a startup hub? Uh, the answer is depressingly straightforward. Be an even better research university. CMU is one of the best universities in the world, but just stop and imagine, stop and imagine what it would be like if it were the best and everyone knew it. And when people named universities, they would say, well, there's CMU and then Harvard and MIT and other places, right? Um, there are a lot of people out there who have to be at the best place, wherever it is, just because it's the best. They will go to Siberia, right? So they will take a red eye from the West Coast to get here, if that's what it takes. Um, yeah, that's one thing to fix. Uh, being that kind of talent magnet is the most important contribution universities can make towards making a place a startup hub. In fact, I think it's probably the only contribution they can make. But wait, you're thinking. Um, I couldn't believe what I was hearing as I was walking in. I'm thinking, oh boy, we got a little bit of a contradiction here. Um, shouldn't universities be setting up programs with words like innovation, and entrepreneurship in the names? Um, no, they should not. Uh, these kind of, oh, really, you even like that, all right. Because that was the part I was most worried about. Um, that was the evolutionary bottleneck of goodwill in this talk. Um, the targets they're pursuing are too broad. You do not get innovation by chasing after innovation. You get innovation by chasing after better batteries or better 3D printing. And you can't do entre... Wow. Do you feel enlightened? <laughs> Is it better with the lights on or off? On or off? On. OK, it's better with the lights on. I assume that was an AV guy and not uh, some unworldly force. Um, all right, where were we? Um, Innovation and entrepreneurship. By the way, those are words I never use voluntarily except in square quotes, scare quotes or to make fun of them. Um, I know it may disappoint some administrators to hear that the best way to encourage startups is to be a great university. It's like telling people who want to lose weight that the best way to do it is to eat less, right? <laughs> It's so depressingly straightforward, but look at the empirical evidence. If you want to know where startups come from, look where the big startups came from. You know where they came from? A couple of founders getting together, organically making something that starts out as a side project, right? And then it grows into a startup. Universities are great at bringing together founders, but beyond that, really, the best thing they can do is get out of the way. For example, by not claiming ownership of the so-called intellectual property that they create in the first place, right? You don't need to license it to anyone if you don't own it. Um, or by having really liberal policies about deferred admissions and leaves of absence and stuff like that. In fact, one of the most brilliant techniques for encouraging startups is an elaborate form of getting out of the way pioneered by Harvard. Uh, Harvard used to have final exams for the fall semester after Christmas. And in the beginning of January, they had this strange thing called reading period, where you were supposed to be studying for your exams. And Facebook and Microsoft have something in common that few people realize. They were both started at Harvard during reading period because it's the perfect situation for encouraging the side projects. That, that turn into startups. All the students are there on campus, but they don't have to do anything because they're supposed to be studying, right? Um, Harvard may have closed this particular window because they moved, they moved exams before Christmas, or the holidays as they're now called, um, and they shortened reading period from 11 days to seven, which is enough to make people think exams are imminent and maybe they ought to study for them. So maybe there won't be any more Facebooks and Microsofts coming out of Harvard, but that idea is out there for any university that wants it. Um, there's the empirical evidence. 
the empirical evidence weighted by market cap strongly suggests <laughs> the best thing universities can do is literally nothing, right? Um, all right, the culture of Pittsburgh, you guys are an example of it. The culture of Pittsburgh is another of its strengths. The empirical evidence here strongly suggests that a city has to be very politically liberal to be a startup hub. Right? If there's going to be a startup hub in North Carolina, that's going to be a real first. Um, <laughs> and it is clear why. Startups are strange. And it's not just the ideas are strange, everything about them is strange. And you can't pick and choose to tolerate just the kinds of strangeness that turn out to produce great startups because strangeness is all intermingled, right? You know, you go talk to Larry and Sergey, and the strangeness is deep. Um, <laughs> Is this talk being broadcast? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so you have to tolerate all strangeness, and that immediately rules out a huge chunk of the United States. Um, so uh, almost all other potential competitors are in red states, whatever the bad states are, they're just out. Um, so uh, I'm optimistic it does not rule out Pittsburgh. One of the things I remember from growing up here is how well everyone got along together. And I didn't realize there was anything unusual about this at the time, but I realized later other cities are different. Why? I think part of the reason it's a college town and people in college towns are tolerant, but I think there's more to it than that. And I was amazed that, what was the mayor's chief of staff called? Kevin? Kevin. Kevin actually gave an example of what I'm going to talk about in this talk. I was so pleased. You'll see. Um, so uh, I remember. I think one of the things that makes people here tolerant is that everyone feels like an immigrant. I remember this from growing up. When I grew up in Pittsburgh, people did not call themselves Americans. They called themselves Italians or Serbians or Ukrainians, right? And Kevin did it. He said, the mayor is an Italian. You know, the mayor's not an Italian, right? <laughs> Ask people in Texas what the mayor is, and they would say, he's an American, right? But no, in Pittsburgh, he's an Italian. And this makes everybody get along. Just imagine what it was like 100 years ago with people pouring in from 20 different countries, all speaking different languages. Tolerance was the only option. And that became part of the, traditional, the tradition of this city. What I remember about the culture of Pittsburgh is that it's both tolerant and pragmatic, right? People here get the job done. Um, and that is exactly how I would describe the culture of Silicon Valley, which is not a coincidence because Pittsburgh was the Silicon Valley of its time. If you study, like high tech was dynamos, right? Dynamos here and internal combustion engines in Detroit. Um, and like the, the things that are new now are different, but the kind of spirit you have to do to do that kind of work is the same and you still have it here. So it'll adapt to new kinds of work. So although uh, the idea of an influx of latte-swilling hipsters might seem horrifying, um, I encourage you to tap into that spirit of tolerance um, and, and encourage them. Um, encourage weirdness even unto the degree that wacko Californians do. Um, for Pittsburgh, that is a conservative choice because it's a return to the city's roots. All right, so I saved the ba I'm not done yet. Am I, am I out of time? No. Okay, I'm not out of time. Okay, because I have, now I have the bad news. Um, unfortunately, I saved the toughest part for last. There's one more thing you need to be a startup hub, and Pittsburgh does not really have it. Investors. Silicon Valley has a big investor community because it has spent 50 years growing one organically. New York has a big investor community because it is full of people who love money and are quick to notice new ways to get it, right? <laughs> But Pittsburgh has neither of these, and so if you grow a big investor community, it'll have to happen the way it did in Silicon Valley, which is slowly and organically. I mean, really, it's been like 50 years. Uh, but that's not as bad news as it would have been a decade ago, because there's three big trends that make investors less necessary. One is simply that startups are a lot cheaper now, so you just don't need their money as much as you used to. The second is things like Kickstarter. You can just get to revenue faster, so you don't need to depend so much on outside money. And the third is things like Y Combinator. You can go to Y Combinator for three months, pick up funding after demo day, and then come home if you want to. Um, what should you do? Okay, so uh, my advice 
is to make Pittsburgh into a great place for startups, right? Um, and gradually, more of them will stick. Inevitably, you will lose a lot of good companies in the beginning to other startup hubs, and you just have to endure that. The only way to stem the exodus in the short term is by lying to them and saying, you know, you'll be just as well off here as you would be in Silicon Valley. Well, no, but, um, but some people will stay, right? If it's a really great place, gradually more people will stay, and you'll get, you'll get stuff sticking to the seed crystal. Um, so, you, you, I mean, you have to pick whose interests you're going to serve. The founder's interests and the city's interests are not identical. You can't pretend they are. You have to choose explicitly which they're going to serve, and it has to be the founders, or the founders won't listen to you. And so, serve the founder's interests. Some of them will leave, right? If you love somebody, let them go. Um, but if you do that, you'll serve the city's interests in the long term. It's not a fast path towards becoming a startup hub, but it is at least a path which is more than a lot of cities have, more than almost anywhere has. And it's not as if you have to make painful sacrifices in the meantime. Think about what I've suggested you do, all right? Here's a list. Encourage the local restaurant scene, preserve your historic buildings, take advantage of your density, make CMU the best university in the world, and encourage a spirit of tolerance. These are sacrifices. These are all the things that make Pittsburgh good to live in now. All I'm saying is you should do more of it. And that's an encouraging thought. Because if Pittsburgh's path to becoming a startup hub is to be even more itself, then there's a good chance you'll do it. It will take a lot of effort and a lot of time, um, but if anywhere can do it, Pittsburgh can. Thank you.